One, two, three, four. Hello there, and welcome to the Sports Scientist Podcast. Uh, I'm your host, the only one you should care about, and uh, this fat guy, the marshmallow man, a PhD in marshmallows and uh, <laughs> fat people stuff. I'm not fat shaming fat people, but you know, if it jiggles, it's probably fat. <laughs> and uh, to my left, uh, Dr. Jakey uh, Reedy, uh, sports physiologist and a professor of like uh, stuff that I don't understand. There's a bro in the fucking James is still alive. The T1000 <laughs> failed me again. Yeah. That's it. Go ahead, Mike. Rip it. Yo, yo. Check, check. One, two, one, two. We're going to start off with, uh, hello, welcome to the Sports Scientist Podcast. I guess we should start it's off good place. That. It's been a while. <laughs> good place to start. Yeah, a while. it's been a while. A kind of rusty. Again? Say what? No. Carry on. Yeah, huh? carry on. All right. I'm going to start out with a quote that uh, our mutual friend Yasha has uh, taken a picture of, and I want everyone's thoughts on it. This picture, uh, as, uh, it was at the Nike store. And it says, quote, if you have a body, you are an athlete. What if you're a ghost? A ghost athlete? It's a spirit body. It doesn't have like an actual body. Well, there are ghost athletes, James. What the fuck is your point? I'm asking, just, just, are there ghost athletes? Because they don't have bodies. That's a good point. Oh, I'm going the other way. What if your body like doesn't have a discernible constitution? Like if you're a jelly, like a gelatinous. So cube. now you're meat shaming, meat body shaming. <laughs> or if you're like a zombie See, in D&D rules, like, if you can't be Zombie critically athlete. hit. All right, Vin Diesel, take it easy. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Oh, God. Jake, is, does I mean, everyone have, have a body an athlete? I, I guess we got to ask what an athlete is. Somebody that has a body. <laughs> <laughs> is that That's the definition of an athlete now, yeah, eh? That's the lowest have, in the world. You just got to have a body, yeah. and you're, holy hell. That that's, means that's like a doctor. Guard. Yeah, it means like a doctor can come in to see a patient who's completely inactive their whole life, weighs like 600 pounds, and he's like, so I see from your chart, you're an athlete. And they're like, no, I'm not. He's like, no, you have a body, you're an athlete. Bro. It's it's Nike, trust me. Nike said. So. I feel like that's the same thing asking if like esports are athletes or not. Yeah, they're people who play video games. Right. Like, they have bodies. MLG, But babies, they play video games. Yeah. I mean, it's like, not dogging it, but. Can you imagine like one of those guys like in first class sitting next to like an NBA player flying somewhere? And these are both rich. And he's like, the NBA player's like, oh, what do you do? He's like, yeah, I'm an athlete. The NBA player's like, What's up? What sport? You're like esport. We're like, I don't know. What it is. is that the ecstasy sport? I, I play Counter Strike. <laughs> like, oh, like in real life with real guns. They're like, no, it's still a video game. Like, what you trying to say oh, about cool. Counter Strike? I'm I'm surprised people are still playing Counter Strike and still making money playing Counter Strike. Right. Oh yeah, Some, somebody just got busted for cheating hardcore on it too. What? How do you do yeah. that? Uh, I have no. Sometimes idea. Sometimes they have like E-Police. a modded version of the game. Yeah, he had some like. Aiming mod. Oh, that he got caught shit. in competition. Oh, yeah. Damn. I can't believe that. What an asshole. Yeah. He should be banned and drug tested and banned again. What would they drug test for in esports athletes? Adderall. Stimulants. <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> Amphetamines. No, the same stuff that like. Um, Pro vigil, new vigil. Oh, like, the things are heart rate. Rest, yeah, resting heart rate. Resting things, heart rate. Um, exactly. What are those called? It's a. Uh, shit the beta blocker beta blocker yeah because yeah. it keeps them like violin performer calm right exactly <laughs> but that's not performance enhancing <laughs> right that just calms you down yeah so you can perform really well so exactly. mlg guys do have are all athletes yeah i agree who mlg major league gaming oh wow sports it's called yeah there's actually a, a there's a, a netflix series that's called like what is it or some, something something like that and what the, it is what it is and if they're <laughs> like kidding. they're like 20 30 minute mini featurettes on different topics like they have one on e, uh, like uh, bitcoin they James have one Hoffman's on daily life yeah <laughs> they have one on uh, esports so if you want like a quick quick synopsis of esports oh, there there's go. a little netflix one. Well, our netflix blog from james hoffman all right folks jake reed a dr reed to you plebeians is a sports scientist and you have been uh, previously employed as a sports scientist in what capacity um, well, I was at Texas A&M doing and, what? Uh, monitoring, just essentially running the GPS tech in there, just doing some basic monitoring stuff, but just data management analysis, helping it, interpretation, making shit happen. Foosball. You playing foosball behind Football. my back? It's the devil's game. I was. So because Jake is a monitoring expert, we have monitoring questions for him from the wonderful world the wellspring of knowledge would do you think it would be better if we used twitter 
No. Yes. That place is yes. awful. God. I'm not even on Twitter. No, I'm on Twitter technically because my Facebook auto posts to Twitter. But if anyone's reached out to me on Twitter, I don't ever respond because I don't know how to log in. I literally lost get, my login. I have no we idea. should get Xbox <laughs> Live questions. Ooh. Xbox Live. A 13-year-old's like, hey, Get Fuck you. Don't say it. <laughs> They're going to make mom jokes and racial shit. Yeah, know. that's probably what they would start with. All right. Yeah. So, um, some questions about monitoring from Instagram. Hypothetical situation from the real Jay Leck. Mm. If I measure my HRV, heart rate variability, and it says my performance may be down and I have a poor training session, is it more likely a physiological cause or did seeing that my performance is predicting to be down result in me psychologically limiting my training, a self-fulfilling prophecy of sorts? I have a hunch it would be better to combine HRV with additional fatigue management methods, but an answer from an expert would be nice. Uh, you you have to use multiple things. Like it's, I, I always give the analogy of having a toolbox. Like You don't have a toolbox that just has a hammer in it. Like you have a drill, you have saw, you have a bunch of other things that are there to help you build a house or build whatever the hell you're building. Cock rings. Exactly. Like <laughs> it's super important component to it. Mm-hmm. But if you're, you're relying on just HRV and you see that I'm in the red and I got to back off and then you go try to train hard and it's bad. Like, yeah, there's probably a psychological component. There's probably some physiological issues as well. But end of the day, you already went into that knowing that it's going to be tra- shit. So why would you even do that? Whereas if you had other metrics that were able to help either validate that or at least to say, hey, you know what? That might be the case, but everything else looks good. Let's go kick some ass. Like you have to have other things. I mean, it doesn't need to be tech. It can just be as super simple stuff. But yeah, you have to have something else. How how many metrics do you think is the beginning of a decent monitoring toolbox? Are we talking about 10? Are we talking about 3 to 5? Are we talking about 18,000, which is how many Marcos has for his daily I just got my aura ring. That's it. Oh, yeah, just one. That's right. Uh, You got to measure cause and effect. So you should probably have at least like like cause being training volume specifically a a lot of the time. Um, So you should probably know what the hell you're doing that's going to cause, that's going to lead into some effect and your effect should be probably multifaceted. So a psychological uh, variable, some sort of physiological things like body weight, heart rate, and then perceived fatigue. Um, Sickness is a good one. And then if you're feeling sore or not, like you go, you cover those four or five things, you'll be able to have enough information Mm. to know. That sounds pretty familiar. Something that, (laughs) been preaching for a long time i haven't i I don't believe in any of that nonsense i think you should go from uh, by what you feel from your heart yeah there's a name for that what is it like intuitive training intuitive training yeah Yeah. that's dorian yates what he thought about intuitive training he said if i did intuitive training i'd be on my couch having a beer right now you know who uh (laughs) and then he won his six mr olympia (laughs) lee priest he did intuitive training yeah it was lee priest is like uh Weird. Kind of known for being an iconoclast. What do you think about people who get face tattoos like Lee Priest? It's a commitment. It's definitely a, you know, you're willing to go out and say, I'm I'm going to color my interactions with everyone from now on in a very sort of preconceived notion kind of way. It's I like the shape of different. my head. You know, you don't look at me and say, oh, that man's a <sighs> computer programmer. You say, he's probably violent. In some yeah, capacity. it's like, for me, it's like, there's something off. Like, something's weird. You're, I mean, like, if you're willing to get a tattoo on your face you are willing to dismiss a lot of like normal social interactions. You I don't know, know like, man. Weird... What about the dude that gets a Prince Albert? Can't see it right away. And then by the time we get there, it's too late. But that's covered There's up. There's probably more right? Prince Alberts than there are face tattoos. No one's like having their fucking schlong and their Prince Albert flopping around out in public. Depends My where you're at, James. Face no, tattoo is like no, just out there. Claim. Depends where you're at. <laughs> I just know that the face tattoo, tattoo took away from my enjoyment of the China salesman last night. Oh, God. Folks, I, we have a movie recommendation. <laughs> We saw a Steven Seagal film called The China Salesman. It was also a Chinese-produced film. Just to give you a sense of how amazing this movie was, it was two hours long. It was an action pseudo-documentary. And it uh, cost $20 million. We looked this up. It was $20 million to make, and it netted $1.2 million in box office. That's global. Just, that's Global, correct. Oh, you can't forget Mike Tyson's in it. Mike Tyson's in it. Yes. Face tattoos. Dude, it's so fucking bad. Steven Seagal's in it for maybe a collective 10 minutes. Yeah. Oh, that's generous. And it, his, his, his role yeah. is like, again, it's by no means totally clear. Totally unclear. Mike yeah. Tyson tries to do like an Afrikaans accent the whole oh, time. It's just... Yo, it's the kids. What, what's up, my brothers? 
That was literally it. It was yeah. literally like, I'm trying to reclaim my tribe. Like, and we're like, what? <laughs> Where one of our friends was like, oh, oh, he's trying to do an accent. <laughs> Steven, that was halfway I'm through the f- movie we recognized it. <laughs> yeah. Steven, I'm going to uppercut you till you fucking lose weight. That's exactly what he did. Yeah. And, it, and he did. It was literally like seen it? a communist propaganda film. Yeah. Oh, it was wow. like the West just wants to install cell phone towers in Africa to exploit people, but China's going to do it for free and give the source code out and some shit. Or like, That's oh, dope. That's, mm-hmm. Communism never exploited anyone. All right. Um, Glenn Moen, maybe his real name, maybe not, says, Dr. Reed, how reliable and how valid. Damn. This motherfucker coming in swinging. Marcos, you see this? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, he says, how reliable and how valid are our current wearables regarding the data collection of metrics like heart rate? Are they going to get better? Big love to RP. That's actually a good question. Really yeah, good that's question. a legitimate question. Um, it honestly depends on what tech you're getting into. Um, things like, so the established companies are somebody that you can rely on pretty well um, for like things polar like, or something yeah like polar garmin that kind of stuff um the biggest problem that's coming across it especially with wearables that are on the wrist is that when you go and do any sort of activity that moves and it doesn't get shit so you can totally lose reliability um with it uh it's getting better of course but it's still it's still got ways to go so if it's wrist only you wouldn't recommend people buy it not for if, if measuring heart rate during a training session is important to you. But if you're looking at resting heart rate, fine. That's great. If you're going to sleep with it and whatnot. Um, other ones, you got things like the shirts that are actually the measuring like respiratory rate, heart rate. What? Yeah. Dead serious. Some do like terrible uh, EMG. Like oh, my God. Like oh, that's awesome. EMG. Do yeah. any of them breathe for you? Like Sponsor me. That's the next stop. Yep. That's it's the first layer of us getting our exoskeletons. Oh my god, I can't wait. Yeah, absolutely. But no, they're bad. Some <laughs> some of some of it's good. Like you get into like respiration, that kind of stuff. It's awful. It does. It shows Still you just nothing. Noise. Okay. Yeah, for sure. It's not. I don't know anything that's been around for a long time. You can pretty be pretty confident that it's gonna like it's been around for a long time. It's somebody's gonna have analyzed it. Somebody's gonna have said, "Hey, look, something's wrong. Let's fix it," and they'll have fixed it. But this new fancy new stuff, I never touch it until it's older. Like, so, would you say like a take home point for folks listening is if you're thinking about wearable tech to track, you know, body uh, dynamics that go with tried and true that's been around for a while, go with simpler. And oh, leave yeah. the fancy stuff to people to sort out and don't be the one that pays for it. Oops. Yeah, absolutely. 100%. Jake, what do you think about um, the like the wireless accelerometers? Those have been out for a little while now. Do you Have you used a uh, lot of them? Example? So there's like the push unit. Oh, yeah. There's like the beast, like the little magnet Bluetooth ones. They seem pretty cool. I've used them before. The One of the big limitations is actually just their sampling rate because they're Bluetooth. They're yeah. like 20 hertz or something, just like really which for the bar was here and then it was here yeah, yeah so 20 sure. hertz means 20 measurements per seconds which which sounds like a lot but it, comparatively like when you do something in a lap it'll have like a thousand hertz right so it's like not even close have you used a lot of the accelerometers or? i actually have a push band um that's been va- validated like even with vicon like at the highest level so some of them are good uh, it, but it really does depend like, uh, unfortunately, you either got to go into white papers or you got to go into something else to actually be able to, like, or research to know, is it actually good or not? Uh, like, shoot, when we were at A&M, they had um, these uh, monitors in the helmets to measure um, concussions and, like, for concussion risk. And... It just measures blood. <laughs> it's flat. You bled onto it. Well, the, you know what's the funniest thing? So their uh, white paper, which a white paper is what they're like Yo, fam, internal. You keep saying white paper. And, uh, I you know, just right? Paper. I'm, it's an, uh, there's an underlying tone there. I hope you're getting it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Put it out there. <laughs> no, that's just like the term for their internal like val- validity and reliability. And they literally like hung a sledgehammer in the air and let go of it and smashed it into a ballistic gel skull to like determine if just their whole game but these helmets were coming up and it was like oh here's 1000 hits of that are within the magnitude of danger it's like well a is that right and if so what the fuck but b it's like well it's probably not right thousand was high but it's still like 100 150 in the time period that you wouldn't expect it to be in so 
some it's a lot of false positives basically yeah tons of false positives and it's it's kind of good because it's going to detect every hit that is a concussion inducing hit oh, but it's sure. kind of bad because coaches will try it and it'll be like so our guys are basically just dying on the field permanently even during practice we're like yep yeah, like all right this, this is bullshit we're not getting anything out of this yep. yeah so i think that kind of stuff you, you you'll either dismiss it immediately because you're just like oh it's just like giving me so much I'm, who cares right? right or you'll be too conservative yeah. right where you yeah. be like oh every contact like matters now where bef- i would prefer that the nfl switch to two hand i was just gonna say that oh man <laughs> flag football hall of fame you know rugby like they, we do a lot of two hand touch most <laughs> you anywhere do. you go play people will do uh, just for practice purposes because there's times where you don't need to do full contact it's totally okay this is uh, america every time it's full fuck contact goddamn white. right brother mm-hmm. tell you what man we're hitting people out here man Man, you ever seen a bald eagle two hand touch a fucking rodent? (laughs) (laughs) Have you guys seen the uh, there's been like a a football league lately with just no pads? It's football rules, no pads. Oh, god, yeah, in America Mm -hmm. or Russia? No, here. Oh, shit, it's nasty. This is people teeing off on each other, yeah. No, it's That's like just it total is. like smashing each other as is hard as possible. Rate, like, pretty nonsensical. It's, uh, I, I would assume so. I have no idea, but I don't know. <laughs> oh, get tackled once without a helmet. You're probably like, you know what? I'm good. I'm not playing this shit. Again. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a low roster's flowing. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, next question. Oh, ooh, a very interesting one <clears throat> from Rumpelix. Mm-hmm. A gentleman that looks like, like a completely one white rumps? face with gray background because he doesn't have a yeah. I guess no no picture. A man that is staying away from the all same right, guys. Rumpelstiltskin ask what? You know, why are you getting all fucking contestation? I'm trying to get on with the questions, bro. I want I want to get to the good shit. You need like uh, the spirit calming. I know. I haven't done a ceremony in a while. <laughs> so, <laughs> all right. Rumpelik says, "How much does the vertical leap ability of an individual stand in relation with genetics, and how much with actual athletic performance?" E.g., how much can this ability be increased through sheer training, and how much is predetermined through factors like fast, slow twitch fibers? And he's got a part two, which we'll get to, we'll get to in a bit. The first thing I'd like to say before we let these animals just tear it apart is there is a presumption in this question, which may be accidental, so I'm sorry if I'm inferring too much, that genetics and actual athletic performance have nothing to do with each other because they're being treated as independent variables. He's saying it's either genetics indicator or athletic performance athletic performance and genetics that overlap about 90 yeah. percent. <laughs> so i would say that my per- first answer is the vertical leap is highly genetic and highly related to athletic performance also yeah. i think there's a, another point worth differentiating within the question is it is it just raw ability like raw jumping ability or is it the capacity to improve mm-hmm. I th- I'm, within the question i'm not sure if what you know like are you saying like is it genetic or training or you say like well some people are just more genetically gifted and they will have bigger vertical leaps but some people can train really hard and improve it more than somebody than some other they're responders to training you know what i mean so it's like there's definitely there's an average response to training which i would say to well jake what do you think the average ability of a person within a several year time frame to improve their uh, vertical leap uh, is it something on the order of like endurance training where you can like double and triple your abilities or weight training where you can get two times three times stronger or is it something more akin to like a 10 percent improvement or something like that what do you think? i think it you have to look at where they're starting just like initially okay like if you take somebody that's you know let's just assume like a base uh, college, fresh college freshman coming in you could get probably 20 percent 10 to 20 percent maybe in a year oh you, no i over the career over the career right. over the four year yeah so if you're jumping like 40 percent under like the league standard you're not going to be an amazing athlete on your jumping ability probably oh no not at all well and the whole reason we measure vertical jump is for power anyway like it's a f- cheap way to look at how powerful somebody is and, and that transfers to other parts of performance right like and, what like what other parts Anything that's going to require some sort of explosion. Um, <laughs> there you go. Go on. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, that's what you meant? Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you look at volleyball. Obviously, jumping is imperative for those specific positions. But then you look at somebody like a, a, a libero. Like, they still have to be powerful. They have to be able to move quickly laterally. Well, that vertical component is obviously it's not lateral in nature, but they're still using the same musculature to get to that point quickly, which is the point of a vertical jump is to be as quick as you can in order to get as high as you can. So... I think it's a, uh, 
it's a good test, but we just got to, I don't know. It's just. Do you think it's old. worth. It's old. <laughs> so I, I think, um, I think two kind of within this question, like, is it, is, is pursuing improvements in vertical jump for the sake of improving your vertical jump, something that's worthwhile <laughs> Or is, you know, for the, just to have a higher measurement and say like, oh, I have a higher measurement now. Or would pursuing other training options, like just getting stronger or just getting generally more powerful, even through like sprinting and other avenues be just as effective? That's kind of where I was struggling with right at the end there. That's spot on. Okay. Like you train for, train for other things and you're, you're like strength, like power, you know, move heavyweights quickly. And, and move lighter weights quickly, cover the spectrum of lo- the load velocity curve, and you're going to get the adaptations that are just going to manifest themselves through the vertical jump. Yes, it's a quick and easy way to look at um, performance change over time. But don't worship the test. Right. But on top of that, ver- jump height is uh, not necessarily a valid test in itself to measure change. Because you tell somebody, okay, I want you to hit that point, and they'll, just, they'll get there. Not necessarily because of the reasons that we want to be able to determine have actually changed. So you have to have some way to look at what caused them to get to that new point. So whether it's how long they spent like in the downward phase of the jump or in the propulsive phase, how long they spent in the air, you know, look at things like the reactive strength index, the ratio of flight time to ground contact time. Uh, those are the things that are actually going to help you in your monitoring process. Whereas pure vertical jump is, like I said, it's outdated. There's other ways to get the same information and just as quick and fr- and free uh, to a degree. You just have to know what you're looking at to get there. You need a force plate for this kind of stuff. Not necessarily. You need a camera, okay. actually. Because so I've been involved in several ventures where I only needed a camera. <laughs> They're fun. Get it, Marco. <laughs> That's my boy. <laughs> you mean like a high speed camera or something like is like an iPad? No, like an iPad, like uh, like a selfie cell phone camera, like the, never mind. I'm just no, <laughs> seriously though, like you can go and uh, my in my research is I look at the reactive strength index for things like neuromuscular. Can fatigue. you define that, please? Yeah, um, it's the ratio of flight time to ground contact time. So how long you spend in the air versus how long you actually spend developing the power to get you there the forces to get you there and we do a depth jump and i record it because it's cheap and free and easy just slow-mo on my camera um on my phone ideally you want the shortest development for the highest jump exactly exactly just get where you need to be yeah spot on and then when people spend a ton of time on the ground to get a really high jump Yeah, that there, there's, there is a performance that, like the training adaptation there that you can actually take into is like, okay, they're strong enough to get there, but they're not doing it very quickly. So now let's focus on the velocity component. Whereas if they're getting a decent jump high or reactive strength index, it's just a ratio. Uh, and, but they're spending a very short amount of time on the ground, but it's not exactly the kind of height you're looking for. Maybe now you focus on the strength component. So like there's, kind of nuances that we can get into with that that's baller damn dude that's some other level shit i didn't know any of that the fuck are you looking at scott not much whoa he speaks <laughs> you gonna edit that out sassy. <laughs> <laughs> yahoo all right so these are surprisingly good questions really so good. far yeah they yeah. are I'm very uh um, people are gonna be like this sucks go back to dicks. i was gonna say i feel no, like worry, i'm like <laughs> Reducing the expect, like no. I expect. No, no, no. You're <laughs> increasing the expectations, <laughs> reducing the value because people come with dick jokes. Yes, you with the dick jokes. The fuck are you looking at, Marcos? You got a fucking attitude problem today? <laughs> Jeez, so <laughs> hostile today. In the blue corner, we have the Ashkenazi Jews. Yes, they're slow, but they're I also. Don't care. <laughs> Look at you. You're disgusting. <laughs> Look at you. Name it in one sport the Dominicans were good at. Wait, hold on. Uh, Except for I, baseball uh, and sex. That's not the sport. I'm going to make a mother joke. Are you ready? Yes. Forget it. I'll tell you later. (laughs) (laughs) It's that good, huh? Sorry, YouTube. You can't have these jokes. Legally, we're not allowed to say too many jokes. All right. Uh, A follow-up to this question. Also, would you consider uh, vertical jumping ability and that being a main key point for an athlete's performance potential overall in terms of explosive power, e.g. for weightlifting, sprinting, etc. So, like, for example, if you test some children, the ones with the highest vertical jumps, are they going to be your star athletes and stuff like that? Mm-hmm. And or if you just come in and just get a group of athletes in a football program, are the highest jumpers going to probably be your best performers? You have a high likelihood of that happening. Okay. It's not perfect, obviously, sure. but there's 
Uh, a very high probability that if somebody is a very good jumper, that they're probably going to at least have the physiological <laughs> ability to do what's necessary. Tactical and everything else and technical are totally, it's totally throws everything out the window though. Although if you have good vertical jumping ability, perhaps your ability to coordinate your body and high velocity movements isn't awful, which means that your ability to pick up and then eventually execute technical abilities is probably not the worst. Right. Like it's hard Kyle's, to say, though. Kyle's cousin from South Park. Hey, hey. I've seen people who were strong as dick, but were motor morons. And can jump. You know, like say, like throw this ball and they're, they're like, eh. you know. Damn. But they can jump too. Yeah. What I'm saying is like the, just because you're physically talented. Sure. Sometimes I've seen them also unable to do like what we would say, yeah. like really basic that sports happens in skills. football where you get like guys who can cut real well, run real fast, but they're just butterfingers and you just can't catch the fucking ball. And you're just like, I don't, I don't know what to tell you. Imagine if you had to get a, like a vertical jump test for like your uh, belt promotion. It's like, ah, oh, man, I keep missing that black belt promotion. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that would be fucked up. Like, <laughs> fuck. Mike One of the like greatest things much. about balance studios in Philadelphia where I train with the Migler Reese brothers and Josh Vogel is the warm up consists of, there's no warm up. You just warm up yourself if you want, and then you just go into technique, and then we roll. I have been to uh, visiting several gyms before. Back in Kansas City, where I started, we do a warm up. It just wasn't that long, so it was okay. I've been involved. I went to Australia one time, uh, several times. One of the time, the warm up. So it was it was ninety two degrees, I think, like outside, and the gym was not air conditioned. Um, Crunky. No, so <laughs> that's like, how balance is. Back off, cat! I'm gonna fucking die. It's uh, so yeah, hot, right? It's but like, good. um, it, here's the thing: when balance has that kind of temperature, ghee turns into literally now it's, it's no ghee now, and there's no warming up, and you just lo- roll at your own pace so that you don't die. At this gym, it was a 45 minute class. We did 30 minutes of conditioning, and then five minutes, 10 minutes, 10 minutes of um, practicing a technique like with like no life resistance at all. And then five minutes of like 90% or 80% effort, just simple positional sparring. And then class was over. I was like, wow, we did two and a half minutes of actual jujitsu. And then we just basically did like a fucking boot camp workout the rest of the time. It was awful. That sucks. They were fluffing you up. We right? ran. We ran for like 20 minutes. You ran? And you just, yeah. Well, I mean, I, I sort of like, you know. Hobbled. Shuffled. I don't know if there was a flight phase so much. <laughs> like both my feet came off at the same time. <laughs> Power walk. Dude, but I just wanted to be like, yo, watch me not run and smash all you fucks. Jiu-jitsu, there is no running. If anyone runs in jiu-jitsu, he's by definition doing something that is penalized. It's illegal. If you're running away... That's bad. If you're running towards a guy, you're getting double legged. I don't know what to tell you. It's just all bad. Yeah. Yeah. Jake, do they still run people in football? Like distance running? Uh, not when I was at AM. That's I good. Mean, we, yeah. They did. They actually did a lot of just intermittent sprinting. Oh, hey, that's with, weird. Yeah. With, with distances that were rele- they're relevant to the actual expectation of the sport, size of field or, or less. Yeah. <laughs> Strange. That um, used to drive me nuts. Like, yeah. When they would literally be doing like shuttle runs that were longer than the distance of the field. So, like, what, what are you training for? Yeah. Right? Like, it doesn't make any goddamn sense. You're going to run three football field lengths in a, in a game at one, t- at one time? Yeah. No. That would be like, they'd be like, you're on like the kickoff return and you run it all the way down and then fumble it and then somebody else from the other team picks it up and runs it all the way down and then they fumble it and you recover it again and I you wish run back. we trained for this. <laughs> Machinod says, how good of an indicator is HRV measured every morning for training fatigue? Is it reliable? A lot of HRV questions. Yeah, always. There are. People really love HRV. Well, well that's because so they're the tech out there. As much as I try to like yeah, poop part on of it. part of biohacking. Yeah. Beep, boop, beep, boop, beep, boop. I mean, the reliability studies are there. It's going to be, it's going to highly depend on your tech that you have available. Huh. Like, if you can do it, great, fine. If you, and if you want to spend the money on that, but I what kind of tech do you need to do it well? <sighs> you need to be able to have something. Well, you need to be able to have something that's actually going to measure while you're asleep. 
Like the protocol to actually measure our HRV requires that somebody, let's say somebody were to come in here, we'd have them lay down on the floor for 15 minutes in the dark <laughs> in a climate controlled environment to get, to be able to make that assessment. Okay. So you have to have something that's on <laughs> assessment, not second. <laughs> uh, Sorry. Something that's on their wrist or to actually get that measurement while they're asleep during the time period that we actually need to look so at people, HRV. So people look at it in the morning, they're actually looking at it at the wrong time already by definition, kind of? It depends when it was taken. Okay. So if they're looking at it like right when they wake up, yeah, probably not. But if it was taken, say, during the three or four hours prior when they were fully asleep. Oh, yeah, no, no, nobody does that. They wake up and they do this. That, they that. confuse it with morning, like morning resting heart rate, like doing those measures independently. Yeah, yeah. okay, so true HRV measurement is done in a night phase. Yeah. And if you're a vampire, it's done... Well, whenever you are not a bat. What if you're Blade? Dan. Day one. Jake, you didn't think you were going to get tripped up as soon as you I got didn't, here, boy. I didn't, didn't, see uh, I didn't expect all the HRV. Yeah. Yeah, because I, I I prefer resting heart rate. I think you get just as big of a mag like a big of a magnitude of effect of how you can modify your programming, and it's free. Like you can lay in bed and do this, and then okay, you're good as long as you do it the same time, the same way every single day, or the days that you're monitoring it anyway. You, a resting heart rate is powerful enough to do what you want it to do. Can you uh, clue us in on how you would use resting heart rate? Uh, to inform intervention into the athlete's program. Oh, easiest one is the classic resting heart rate and body weight trend. Okay. So resting heart rate, it's a, it was a case study, but they looked at resting heart rate and body weight over time, and they were doing daily body weight. It was with uh, gymnasts and um, daily body weight, daily heart rate. Uh, both of them were going down in a similar manner over the course up to uh, day 20. And then at day 20, resting heart rate started to shift upward while body weight kept trending down. So the resting heart rate was what, what it tells us is that resting heart rate is governed by, you know, the, the autonomic ner nervous system where it's just controlled by what the body is actually feeling or uh, sensing within itself. So if it increases, that means it's increasing to try to fix something else to meet, the, to meet, drive. right. To meet the demand of whatever's happening. So heart rate's increasing, body weight's decreasing. So the heart, the heart body's trying to fix itself by providing more blood flow to the, whole system and but yet it's not able to because we were seeing that decreased trend in body weight and is it like day 39 that's almost the definition of overreaching yeah mm -hmm. trying to fix but not able to exactly and then at day 39 they had a career ending injury all of them well, it was just one person it was the case but it's, <laughs> sure, sure, it's sure. a good example and it's just another tool in the toolbox that you can throw in there is to say like okay this is my this is the response to my training stimulus and it's changing over time i know what's about normal for me now things are starting to become abnormal. Why might it be happening? Is everything else kind of going in line? All right, maybe I should start making changes. All right. So I have like a self-fulfilling prophecy style argument, but I think, I think you'll be on board. So usually like people will say like, okay, if my resting heart rate or HRV are, are off a little bit, does that mean I have to stop what I'm doing, right? Or should I start taking fatigue management interventions right away? And uh, my position, and I think Mike has a similar position is, you can't base that off of one variable, right? You can't oh, just know. say like, okay, resting heart rate was elevated, but your performance hasn't changed. It's been constant or steady or maybe even improving over time. Or um, your perception of effort or your perception of fatigue is going down, right? So the I think there's a need to validate these things with multiple measures where you say, okay, like in this case, you have two, fizzy, f two fizz measures, right? You have a heart rate and you have a body weight going down, right? That's two things kind of indicating the same general trend. If you have a, a performance measure, like their lifts are going down, maybe their jumps or whatever else, their sprints are decreasing at the same time. Now you have a fizz and a performance measure saying like, hey, my athlete is not in an acceptable state. So it's one of those like by themselves, they're typically not very powerful mm -hmm. but in conjunction or with collaboration with like psychological performance and other phys measures they can become more useful oh, absolutely. do you agree with that oh 100 percent. and it also depends on like what's the expectation of the season like if you're supposed to be overreaching like, like yeah sorry yeah. go go hard <laughs> you can also tell if they're not overreaching and push them harder mm -hmm. yeah yeah i just one of my the lecture i just recorded same thing they did that study at uh, was a seminal study back in the early 2000s. Uh, Dr. Stone was involved in it at the U.S. Olympic Training Center when they multiplied the uh, weightlifting volume of the athletes by like one and a half and then by two, I think. And they were looking for overreaching measures and they just never found them. They had measured them for weeks Whoa. and they were like, multiply volume. They were like, meh. 
multiply volume. They're like, man, like Dr. Stone's conclusion was like, you guys have been under training for however long you've been running this program. And they're like, years? Like, yep, yeah, years. <laughs> Which is funny because Doc's so pro. I was going to say, he's so conservative. Yeah, but it's like, like a hilarious you know. study. He was like, nope. Because, you know, like you would think, like if you double someone's training volume, they should be like mm-hmm. dead. And they were like, they just kept getting better. And I was like, eh, all right. Like, that's how you know you're just not training enough. Yeah. Dose response. How about that? Yeah, it's a More training, concept. more fitness. So, um, Jake, I'm going to put James on the spot here. Oh, fuck. Uh, yeah. James, take off your clothes. Let's uh, show the world. What's take off on. your clothes. <laughs> um, James has told me before, I don't know where he picked up this nonsense, right? This is the usual places. Instagram. Where alley cats go to die. <laughs> 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 Under your car. Inside your couch. <laughs> uh, oh, man. Don't cats die in like the most inconvenient places? Yeah. Like, <laughs> You'll find them. <laughs> they like go. I've seen uh, stories of cats like, uh, um, like crawling up into an engine space of a car and then dying of old age. And people like start the car and then there's the worst smell in the world for weeks. And like, what the fuck is going on? Like, there's been a dead cat in your engine for three months. Have you heard Why? of vegan cats? Yes. Oh god. I, the, uh, talking what? about like Joe the Rogan, Rogan thing. What? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. No. So people started. It's horrible. You know, people always fuck with Joe Rogan for whatever reason, but apparently. There's this whole group of people that decide that have decided that they're going to feed their cats vegan food. Makes sense. Cats are mostly vegetable eaters. And anyway. Rogan has a whole bit on it on his new special where he's like, if you look up the hashtag vegan cat, it's like the cats look like they're fucking dying because they like want meat. They're just yeah. like, <laughs> he's so lazy. He's a cat. <laughs> and cats aren't like dogs he's, he's where not. they can just eat garbage and eat anything. Yeah. They yeah. mostly they have to eat protein. Yeah. Uh, uh, big cats are pure carnivores. Yeah. Uh, dogs are omnivorous, technically, although they prefer to eat meat. You could do a vegan bear, but that would just be a really sad bear after a while. <laughs> mm. It's like Yogi Bear. Yeah. So my question was going to be, James always says to me, he'll usually wake me up at three in the morning. I'm like, wake up. I'm like, Jesus Christ, what? He's like, listen, if... A bunch of your measurements for your athlete are not looking so good, but performance is still elevating. We have to put a premium on performance and we kind of have to say, ooh, performance is pretty good. Things can't be that bad. James, do you stand by that? that uh, yeah, I think spirit of that statement. Totally, because um, the performance is generally going to be one of the most sensitive measures right and it's also really what's the outcome it's, it's what you care about yeah it's so the it's outcome like, measurement yeah so we say like all these other ones are great but perf- we put more weight on performance right. we say performance is a more heavily weighted variable right. in general so because everything else is just trying to estimate what is going to happen to performance but if you measure performance directly it's like well listen you know if your heart rate variability is this and that it could taint your performance but if it's clearly not then it's not like who cares so, Jake, how would you go about it? So my, my first guess is, like, look, if everything else is telling you you're not doing so well, but your performance is elevated. <sighs> James? I have one coming. It's just not quite, quite there. <laughs> um, it's kind of one of those things, like, probably keep going on the plan. Just stay really alert. And as soon as performance dips, definitely address the problem. But if performance is still going up, and if even all of your other measures are like, uh, you're going to die, um, it's hard to make an argument to say it's time to back up, especially in cases where we're supposed to be kind of pushing it. What do you think? I agree. Like the, the funny thing is with athlete monitoring, it's like this huge buzz word and it has its own industry. Now people think it has this huge magnitude of effect and it has some, like you explained it uh, when we were at East, East Tennessee state <laughs> where it was, it's probably going to have like, a point or two of influence, like in a volleyball match. Mm -hmm. There might have some small magnitude, which that might be the difference between first and last. Who knows? But that's kind of what we're talking about here. So it's very small nuances. And so, yeah, if everything's going well, just keep going. I can't tell you, I of all the data that I have, I have only a couple handfuls of instances where I've seen stuff happen that I've been able to say that, yes, there's light high likelihood that something might occur, and then you either do two things. You make a change or you wait and see. Okay. And I think in that scenario that you're describing, you just wait and see. Okay. If you're not super concerned about catastrophic injury and that you're willing to take the risk and it's necessary for the plan to take the risk, take the risk. Okay. So for now, so so for bodybuilding, for example, that could make total sense, like perfect sense, because if you're bodybuilding properly, you're not really at risk for catastrophic injury. What about for 
um, you know, weightlifting is also tough to get catastrophically injured. What about powerlifting? Like, like performance is good, but all of our under indicators say that like we're real fatigued. That does increase the chance of like your next squat's your last squat. Do you think that enough indicators to counter performance, like performance, let's just assume it's great, great, great. If enough other indicators are like, mm, should you be like, if you don't have a meet coming up, especially, should you just kind of call it and deload anyway? Or should you just be like, look, as long as performance is good and I'm using good technique, I'm just going to swallow the bullet and just go for it. it again, it, it goes back to the plan. If you don't have a meet coming up, what's the harm in backing off a little bit? So better safe than sorry if everything else is telling you to go. Right. But, even but if performance is good, that might mean that your deload, your recovery is even less time. And then you're able to recover and adapt in a shorter time period. You haven't put yourself to the point where you maybe need a week and a half yeah. to get back to where you need to be. So then you have longer time training. Uh, so you recover quicker and then you're able to get back to full training, full go training faster. And you're actually probably able to get better adaptation from it anyway. So like on, on the same idea, if you have like an athlete – in the exact situation that Mike's presented where they have a bunch of other variables saying like, eh, this is probably not great. Performance is good or even or stable. Could that just warrant an investigation where you just say like, Hey coach, like Johnson here, Johnson, or, you know, I have an athlete who, you know, it's, they seem like something's weird. Maybe we should go like, look into it. And you talk to the person and say like, Hey, what's going on? Like, Oh, my mom died or like, Oh, you know, Jesus Christ, James, but this kind of stuff happens mm -hmm. where they are, you might be hit, getting hits on like psychological perceptive measures and even heart rate measures because of outside stressors, right? The training's not fucking them up. It's because some weird shit happened porn, in their porn life. Got a 404 error. Yeah, exactly. Like, they're not, right. they're not able to look at porn anymore at Starbucks. It's a thing, by the way. What? Yep. No, I'm sorry. Uh, explain. This uh, is, is relevant. Starbucks is uh, taking away. They're putting some block in uh, to not allow porn. porn you know hub. that's because people were watching it and playing. Oh hell yeah! It. Oh yeah! Hell yeah! But you know what Pornhub's response was? They came back and they're gonna have. All right, we're gonna have safer workplace workplace videos now. So you can still go to porn, Pornhub, but have the safer workplace. <laughs> that's amazing. That, yeah, what it's that just even, ridiculous. What does that mean? It's, it's ridiculous video. Like, like Showtime porn. The fact like that you're porn? like they're having a like a discussion about how to watch porn at work is like you know it's right. like it's so weird. Like, you're at work. You're at work. You're not supposed to be watching porn. Like right. go to the bathroom. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, I forgot the question. <laughs> Um, so, like, uh, dealing with, like... Um, VPN requests and how to get around Starbucks porn thing. Okay. Like, um, just not necessarily calling to action, like, a, a fatigue management strategy, but even just talking to your athlete, finding oh, yeah, out, yeah, like, yeah, what's yeah. going on with them. Because something might be up. Right. So, the easiest way to think of that is they train hour, two hours a day, maybe up to four, five, six, or six is absurd, but who knows? That's still an incredibly small amount of the day. There's a hell of a lot of other things that are going on in that person's lifestyle. So that's where the questionnaires become nice because or questionnaires or any of the monitoring, it facilitates conversation. Yeah. It gets it so you can actually go and talk to the person. Like you're not supposed to look at the screen and say, hey, now you got to go do this. It's look at it and say, I am now informed about something that I might need to be aware of. I'm going to go forward and ask them Get about more it. more information. Right. It's, that's all it's doing. It's providing you more context that you might not have already been aware of to either support what you already believe or it might be telling you something that you weren't aware of into the conversation. Because that's what needs to happen. You have to have a conversation with somebody especially in that scenario because i think james's point is probably what would hap would be happening in what you were describing yeah the gym might be their happy place that might be where they can go in and totally just get rid of all of the other parameters that are hitting hitting bad yeah. but that's where they're like i get to go in here i get to chill out i get to do the things that i want to do and this is that's where the life isn't happening yeah i'll tell you what if you're a regular person the gym is your escape i think that's great if you're an athlete the gym is your escape that's bad news folks. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. the gym needs to be hell if you're an athlete the rest needs to be an escape which brings me to another frustration i've had and um this is stupid, but it just, you know, some stuff you've seen your whole life, it's bullshit, but it never stops pissing you off. And sometimes it starts wearing on you more. Christmas um, music. I love Christmas music. Oh. Watch your mouth. Although they started playing it like the day after Halloween and I was like, what? <laughs> um, so the, there are people on Instagram and stuff will like post a video of them lifting or a picture and they'll say something to the effect of all day, every day. And I just want to be like, what? what is it that you do every single hour of the week 
that you want recognition for. It, it, it's, and they're like, you know, all of this are like, yo, we grinding like all day, every day. We're grinding out here. Like we're, we're putting in work. Like you, you can't work that. No, you're not training that much. And recovery is a huge part of sport. And, and I know you motherfucker. I know you missed half the sessions in the week anyway. Lion ass bitch. Talking about pojada and everything. Every day pojada. <laughs> Which is, like, cool, but, like, every day, like, you don't even roll seven days a week, man, you fucking liar. Like, I hate that shit. Why can't people just talk about, like, when I'm in the gym, I train hard? That's great. You know, that's not even, that's not true because you deload sometimes. But it's closer. Why do people have to be like, yo, no days off? Like, you get some kind of fucking award for that? You know. The, the hardest working athletes in the world take days off because they're not fucking dumb. What I'm hearing between all the HRV stuff and the athletes and the dumb Instagram assholes, I think, during your deload <laughs> those week. Those are athletes. <laughs> those guys, They think too. they are. <laughs> uh, Remember, for you your deload week, um, maybe just try 10 grams of dried mushrooms and uh, you'll figure all your shit out. Not my you stuff. might not even come back pow, to pow. sport. Nope. Why are you even an athlete? Ask that question. But all that bullshit will just fucking come out. You'll be like, oh, that's what's wrong with me. That's why I keep getting injured. I have actually been to the gym on mushrooms before. Fuck. Did what? You, like to lift or just to experience it? I, uh, to experience it. Oh, of course. <laughs> I was just like, like, dude, you're out of your mind. Five by ten squats program. <laughs> um, to experience it, I went in. So first of all, the music was everywhere. I was like, how did they get the music everywhere? Why is it uh, bouncing off the walls of my big ass head? <laughs> Second of all, all the mirrors are amazing. Third of all, the lights are so different than any other place. I'm like, whoa, there's tons of lights everywhere. And the, it was just a real, like, weird look. It was so cool. That's crazy. Um, some of the people lifting, I was like, man, you feel like cultural shit on mushrooms. You're like, I'm not talking about, like, major culture. I'm talking about, like, subcultures. Like, I think these guys were lifting and they were posturing and walking around. And I was like, it's really important for that man to feel dominant and powerful and i and i sense it but at the same time i know that when he looks at me he doesn't feel that anymore because i'm like three times more jacked but i I just want him to communicate i just want like to look at him and know i accept you for all of the dot i love it you're great i think you're great the way you are Mm -hmm. i think it's cool that you're being an alpha male but even if you didn't want to be it's okay (laughs) it's fine (laughs) and you're talking to the little boy inside that House of muscles like, that listen, he built. I, he's crying. Listen, we're just, we can be, you don't have to posture at me, man. It's great. And then I did like a, a couple curls of 25 pounds. Young shits are heavy. <laughs> bro, holy shit. I was like, oh shit, fuck that. I can barely stand up. And then I had a panic attack on the Uber ride. Did you down. really? <laughs> yeah, more or less. <laughs> Not a real one. Like there was like, it was a bad batch. And uh, I got into like some shit where I couldn't really breathe that well. <laughs> so I was like, <laughs> <laughs> and like I need to set the fuck down. Uh but then it was great after. Fuck, that's awesome. Yeah. Coming 2021 <laughs> RP Underground Psychedelic Lifting Program. Yo, fuck a program. Let's do a retreat where people are like, we're gonna learn about sports science. Like, mm, sort of. We're gonna, gonna learn about, about maybe we're gonna learn about everything around here. Yeah. Oh, Jake's gonna I hook swear. everyone up with monitoring devices and then send them to the moon with ten grams oh, of God. <laughs> Jake's That'd like be a um, hell of a study. Let's like, see Jake, how's it going? He's like, he's fine, he's fine that guy's been dead for hours. <laughs> i've been looking to see how long he's gonna come off he signed the waiver it's fine the body's fine. still going yeah. but his brain's not he's not there Dude, i'd be like if any of you fucks ask a mini cut question i will kill you <laughs> <laughs> it's the, oh, it's the, the ghost body cuts. dude he's like but okay never mind <laughs> <laughs> shut up ghost guy you can't mini cut <laughs> yep. you don't even have a body bitch <laughs> all right um ooh, this is a good one for all of us here uh, what's the time frame here? You, you Russian me, Scott? You the no, only you Russian in here. <laughs> you said that very smug. He was like, 48. We are all Russian when we have a cup of bottle of vodka. Yes. <laughs> I don't know why you smile. What is this uh, happy feeling inside my... Uh... Happiness is when famine go away. Huh. <laughs> and killing start. By the way, I, uh, I got the audio book of uh, Solzhenitsyn's gulag archipelago uh, it's basically all about like famine oh yeah <laughs> it's no, horrible yeah. it's yeah brutality yeah anyone who's like i'm a socialist you just have them read that book and they're like um nuance clean now. your damn yeah, room like, and read a gulag archipelago it's number one on my book list <laughs> on my website hey jordan peterson good to have you on the you know what fuck booking actual guests on this mug we're just gonna have marcos do impressions of everyone i gotta practice yeah. Who that was pretty else? good. Well, else? so we're going to have Jordan Peterson. Who else can you do? Hey, can you do Ben Shapiro? Go ahead. Make fun of my people, Marcos. I'll do that one behind. behind do cameras. Trump. <laughs> I 
Can't do it. <laughs> you got to practice. Trump. I got to practice. Yeah, the sports scientist is the best podcast. It's the really the greatest. It's phenomenal. It, 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 no one has a better podcast. The Russians called me. They said they want the sports scientist <laughs> podcast to themselves. Uh, Tanner Wine. Uh, that reminds me of the strong, uh, so strong. The song "Strawberry Wine." Mm. You guys know that one? I know the song. Strawberry Wine by Steven Seagal. Yeah. <laughs> The Punani. God damn it! I have not thought about that <laughs> fucking song. <laughs> Fuck. Yo, that's that's like my favorite song when I did this movie. It was like what I was doing when I was like practicing. Mike stuff. Tyson showed up. Oh, the Punani song was so gross. Mike Tyson, have you read the Gulag Archipelago? <laughs> I think it'd be quite interesting the, because if you look at the at the hero's story, right? So it's like you have this Hydra here, Mike, and I think that really you would. Sorry. I don't, uh, there are no heroes in my story, only villains. <laughs> I have heart disease. <laughs> nah, that was like in shape ago. That wasn't like fucking fat ago, fucking doing bouncy hunter shit. Or cops When's the last time I've seen this guy ran in a movie? Uh, God had to be above the law. You know, if we ever get Steven Seagal on this podcast, it's going to be awfully awkward when he sees this one. Mm-hmm. Well, good thing you know okay. jujitsu for his Akita. Yeah, we looked into booking Steven Seagal. It's hypothetically possible. I don't know Fuck. why we haven't done it. Bro, I would get every Dominican in the Northeast to wait outside with like fucking like waiting for an autograph. That would be fucking awesome. <laughs> he gets in he's like ah, who the hell are all these people like your fans are like I don't have fans like, I got the fucking ah, bodega union whoa, out here bodega. sweet <laughs> um, Tanner Wine at what point do you think it's appropriate to step in and tell someone to stop the ego lifting for example people who load up a leg press with 20 plates for quarter rep calf raises that's a good one nah. so let's talk about that the ethics of who does this person have to be to you for you to tell them something? Yes. Is yeah. there first that, right? Because they be, I am completely of the opinion that random people in a gym are none of your fucking business. They don't even exist. Damn, how many grams They're are you? part of the matrix. <laughs> right. They're, They're all simulations. Fake. Yep. <laughs> um, <laughs> this kid's like, oh my God, my knee, get me out of the leg press. Mark is like, you guys don't have to help him. It's a simulation. <laughs> <laughs> it's part of the test. <laughs> um. So, like, if you don't know the people, yeah, I would just let them do whatever. Mm-hmm. There's a slight possible exception to that rule. Let's explore. They're, like, 13. It's clearly, like, their first week in the gym, and they're doing something that just don't, you obviously just don't know. It's really dumb. Maybe you could be like, hey, buddy, what are you doing? Uh, what exercise is that? And, like, squats, I think. And you're like, oh, cool. Can I give you some tips? And maybe be nice about it. And if they're receptive, great. And if they're not, fuck them. Then motherfuckers got to learn at some point. What do you I guys wouldn't, think? I wouldn't go out of my way to help someone. I know that already. Uh, <laughs> fuck them. Um... You know, when I first started training, like personal training, uh, I wanted to save the world. I was like, I'm going to fucking help everybody. The motherfucker swinging on the lat pull down behind the neck, all that shit. I got you. And after the first year of like trying to help everyone and everyone's like, fuck off, eat a dick. I'm like, you know what? You're right. I'm not going to help anyone who doesn't ask for it. And if, you know, sometimes now that we, we look like we know what we're doing. If well, I get that I, I weird do, you dude, don't. you look like you eat a lot of fucking cereal. Um, but you get that person <laughs> that like makes that awkward eye contact with you when they're doing something like stupid. On yeah, yeah, yeah. They're like, it's a pack deck for, is like up. Yeah, like, just a cry weird. for help. Yeah. And I'm like, you know what? Fucking fine. I'll help you. Yeah. Or I'll make a suggestion and but I'll walk away. Time, but I won't invest too much time because right. it's like, dude, if, if you're bothered by other people ego lifting, you got to work on yourself, bro. Oh, damn. That was deep. Yeah. Well, there's like an arrogance that you have to address too, where it's like. I know what to do. I know better than you, right? That's essentially you might. you might, but that's also like it's not like you said, it's not your position to like go and tell people what to do and like you can't go around thinking that like you know exactly what they're trying to do and that you know how to do it better and you understand the context. You know what I mean? It's like it, it is an arrogant thought process where it's like clearly I'm above you. Like no you're not. You're just another guy in the gym. Yeah, you got to be aware of like just adding on to that like what you have no idea what the hell their plan is. Like, context exactly there's no context at all you go in the gym you see a snapshot hell of a lot more other stuff going on if they're loading up a leg press to do calf raises that might be the end of their day and they might be done in the next five minutes not your lift not your problem there you go yeah yeah so i would say just don't do it it's also like uh, i think especially like men approaching women that's got all kinds of other shit involved. yeah yeah that's another layer. just don't just don't like, so I see, like you're like squatting and stuff. So I could like really help you because I'm like a personal trainer, and I think you should go deeper. 
Yeah. <laughs> it's usually well-intentioned, but it yeah. often comes no off, thanks, off Skyler, the wrong way. Often well-intentioned. Yeah. Well, it's well-intentioned for a variety of reasons, but some of those are not lifting-related <laughs> yeah. intentions. Um, yeah. I, at one point, was uh, training Dr. Melissa Davis, your fiance, mm-hmm. and uh, Annie of RP fame, yeah. also two RP coaches, and... Uh, this was years and years and years ago, and I was like running them through like a deadlift workout at uh, UC Irvine gym, and like at the time I was like you know a little worse body comp than this, but like two thirty five, like clearly lifts, and they were in very good shape, and I was teaching, was clearly instructing them how to deadlift, and this guy who was. 125 pounds at my height. Excuse me. And nerd boys. Cue the nerd boys. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> that's just a speaking that's a Romania Also called <laughs> So, um, he decided, he was also going to illustrate some deadlift technique and started interjecting. And, you know, like, I don't get mad at these things. I was just like, Mel was getting super fucking pissed. Mel but, was probably uh, more jacked than he was. Yeah, oh, yeah, absolutely. She could have killed him on spot, um, but he probably would have enjoyed that. So uh, he was like 125, like 5'6", and he had like hair down to his like ass, which was really cool. So I was like, yo, I'm going to listen to whatever the fuck you say. <laughs> but he was like, like he heard what I said. And he's like, yeah, what you could also do is blah, blah, blah. And Mel and Annie oh. were just like, they did this like resting bitch face like eye glaze where they didn't turn their, they didn't turn their eyes. They just turned their heads at him and they were like. <laughs> and they look back at me and they're like you were saying and i was like so anyway and he like did this like multiple times and i was like dude get out of here i know you're trying to fucking kick it you feel me so nasty okay real quick so, so what ended up happening sorry to finish this yeah, story yeah, finish. uh mel and i made a bet for like 20 bucks she went into the locker room and he was the only one in there and she was like hey do you want to do this or not and he was like yeah and she beat the fuck out of me like i'm pretty sure he died on the way to the hospital <laughs> yeah so I had a similar yeah, experience. Yeah, we were lifting with Alex, Mike's f- friend, Al, who, for those of you who, who don't know who this person is, imagine um, Jack Skellington from The Nightmare Before Christmas. <laughs> you know Al watches these, right? Yeah. Well, the, the, he's 6'5", so, 160. He's like really lanky, right? And we were lifting uh, in Northern California. I don't remember where, but we're at some gym. Al had said like, hey, can you watch me like do some squats? And he was doing it with like, you know, not to, I'm not trying to put He was fun. working on technique. He was working like on technique. Bar, yeah, 65. with like 65 pounds. But he was like, uh, he squats unbelievably deep. He does full yeah. squats at 6'5, which is like a real God. trip to see. Yeah. So yeah, Al's doing his thing. And some like old school, middle aged gym bro guy from buttfuck nowhere comes up and he's, and he's trying to get Al to squat low bar. And I'm like, dickhole. <laughs> <laughs> right, like first of all, this guy's clearly he's he's not like uh, lifting a ton of weight. He's got yeah. sixty five pounds on the bar. Yeah. He's working on technique. Was like, he a ripito guy or what? <sighs> I don't I know. Look down and he spread was like your asshole out. You know, he was like t- prototypical. Like uh, he was like six two, two fifty, but mostly fat, wearing like a you know USA sleeveless shirt and like a you know bandana. He's there to work. Yeah. Just one Did of he those have a guys. Pack? Did he have shorts on? <laughs> No, he had like sweats, you know, uh, like, like the gorilla, like, the, the yes. striped shit, the gorilla like the, wear that's shit. That's awesome. Yes. Because the, uh, the gym <laughs> With a had a no George policy. Yeah, and I was and the the exactly. Just like, dude, wh- what? Are you trying to get this guy to squat low bar when he's got like a 10 on each side? Come on. It was definitely not really polite. Like, I was very oh, polite. Okay, I was just like, oh, oh. interesting. It probably, probably turned to you and was like, so anyway, James, what do I do? <laughs> that's literally, I was just like, keep doing what you're doing. <laughs> you're fine. You know, the guy was like, kind of like gave me one of those because I basically dismissed like, like just do what I said we're here together we're friends yeah. bro trust me I've been lifting for fucking 30 years <laughs> yeah exactly. PhD I wipe my ass with your PhD you <laughs> fucking nerd <laughs> fuck, fuck. Yeah, fucking fuck fucking nerd like, you, you ever run five kidding. grams of test every other day I shoot test in my fucking eyes fucking eyelids I'm blind but I'm fucking jacked. fuck you <laughs> that's the thing though like it's like a level of arrogance like he had no idea he, that that I have a PhD in sport physiology, you know, yeah. been working in your, strength your athletic uh, accomplishments. Uh, he had no idea. He had a PhD in prison workouts. Why are you? Maybe. True. But like, so for you to approach anybody, like you have no idea. Presumptuous. Yeah. It's presumptuous. And you're assuming like that you have a level above them that may or may not so, be. So there's, there's two, there's two funny examples on the internet of that. People telling Konstantin Konstantinovs that he's rounding his back too much. Oh yeah. Yeah. It's like, he's only rounding his upper back. You fucking idiot. 
is a perfect technique. Second one was this guy commented on a Zadrunas Saviskus video, the greatest overhead presser of all time. Zadrunas was doing a, a Smith machine high incline press, and this guy's like, you could get a lot better results if you switch to the barbell version. And like YouTube came down on this guy with one tidal wave. They were like, do you have any idea of who you're speaking to? He's like, it's just technically correct. It doesn't matter who he is. It's like, no, he invented overhead pressing. He could overhead press the moon from the earth if it came and down. And the guy <laughs> overhead presses like a dowel or some shit? Yeah, no, like the had, FMS dowel? He has, like, yeah, he had ah. no videos of it. <laughs> <laughs> He's got great mechanics with a weightless object. Yeah. So in any case, folks. I think we're wrapping it up. We're wrapping it up. It's been real. It's been fun. Dr. Jake Reed, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having us. Great monitoring questions today. James Hoffman, Surpri- great seeing you again. Surprisingly good questions. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, Instagram. Marcos. Finally some real shit. What do you have to say for us on a life note? Uh, for all the young boys watching this shit, wrap that shit up, B. Yeah. Some shit going around. Folks, see you next time. Peace. <laughs>